I'm going to be talking today about parenting from a social justice perspective, specifically talking about how it is that we can teach our children to leverage privilege for good. Um, and I have so much information that I want to share today. Um, it's going to be packed full of information. I'm going to speak fairly quickly, but this session is going to be recorded. So you'll have the opportunity to go back through and revisit certain slides or, or, slides or revisit certain concepts um, if I'm kind of breezing through it rather quickly. I also want to point out that we had received some questions, people submitted questions at the time of registration. I'm gonna try my best to answer the questions that I received ahead of today's session as I'm going through the talk. And then if you have questions, you can please submit those questions to the chat and we will talk about those uh, topics or those inquiries at the end once I'm done with the, the full presentation. So yes, without further ado, let me just get started here. So as far as the overview for today, like I said, there's a lot that's going to be happening over the next 50 minutes to an hour or so. I'm going to talk very briefly about who I am and how I got into this work. I want to talk about allyship and how we can think critically about what that means. I'm going to share with you three short stories on privilege. I think that privilege is a really important construct for us as parents, and especially in the community that we live in, to understand you know, how to grapple with this construct and how to frame privilege responsibly for our children. Um, so we're going to talk about what is a social privilege? What does it mean to have a privilege? What does it mean to have a social disadvantage? Um, and how does that relate to the concept of systemic bias? I'm going to share a resource about conceptualizing systemic racism as a social cancer. And then kind of the meat and potatoes will be six specific ways to teach your children to leverage privilege for good. And then of course, as I said, we'll have um, the Q&A at the end. <clears throat> So right now, before I really start uh, the presentation, I'm just gonna invite everybody who's on the call to take a minute and check in with yourself right now and really take three breaths. You know, it's a work day. A lot of people have been at work. It's been a school day. Some people have returned to school. There's so many things going on and it's hard to get the most out of something when you aren't fully present. So especially a conversation like this, where you know it's going to require some vulnerability and it's going to challenge some of maybe some of our preconceived notions, it's really important for us to just uh, you know, really tune in and become present. So I encourage everybody, and I'm gonna do this myself, to just take three deep breaths right now to center us and to prepare us for this conversation. I just want to remind everyone on the call to just really try to be accepting and open-minded and compassionate because at the end of the day, that's what all of this work and all of this conversation is about. As we go through the conversation, I encourage you to monitor your internal physical and emotional states. If you need to step away from something for any reason, by all means, please do. Um, this is, again, it's being recorded and you can revisit at another time, but be present with what you're feeling. But the good news, what I do know and believe is that if you allow yourself, you're going to really see some things differently today. You're gonna to grow and some part of your perspective will be changed or enhanced. Um, so I had a very thorough uh, intro, so I'm just gonna really quickly talk about uh, some of my life experiences and how they relate to the work that I'm doing now. I always like to frame my conversations about my life experiences uh, with this book, Outliers. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the book, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, but there's a particular uh, philosophy that I really uh, have adopted in my own life, which is if you invest 10,000 hours in anything, you can become prodigious at that thing. And so what I have figured out for myself is that, you know, uh, you know, that 10,000 hours is about a 10 year cycle. It becomes more efficient as you go on. And so I've already lived through a couple of different uh, career cycles. Um, the first one, as was mentioned, was as a professional athlete. I was a professional soccer player from a very young age. I did uh, represent Ghana in international soccer tournaments. Um, 
And I had the chance to play in the FIFA Women's World Cup. So if there's anybody who's a soccer fan, I do have a TEDx talk about that experience. And I think what's important that I'd like to uh, leverage from that experience is just not only was it an opportunity for me to go through a lot of interesting personal development and even, um, you know, development as far as my own identity, being a bicultural woman with one parent who's from Ghana and one parent who's from the United States. And I was born here in the United States. But the other opportunity that was afforded to me was that I was really able to gain a global perspective because I basically had an international career from a very young age. And that was very also formative to my worldview. Um, after retiring from professional soccer, I went into uh, academia. And so, at, you know, I studied environmental science and public health. Uh, as was mentioned, I was a college professor for about eight years here in Southern California, taught at some great universities. Um, but that entire experience was really great in, uh, so that I got training in both qualitative and quantitative research methods. But I think also very importantly, I um, developed the skill of facilitating learning. And so that is something that I wanted to also leverage to broader or wider audiences on other topics that I was, you know, passionate about. I feel like a lot of the learning um, that happens in the university is fantastic. I enjoy teaching. I taught undergraduates. It was great. But I also wanted to be able to facilitate dialogue, facilitate conversation, and facilitate learning in other spaces. So that has led me to where I am now. Um, I would describe myself as a social entrepreneur. My husband and I founded a nonprofit foundation, sports foundation. He's also an athlete. So we raise money so that underserved kids can play sports. I'm the executive director of our foundation. But I also uh, started race, class, and parenting almost six years ago now. Um, and I would just like to respectfully point out that it wasn't in response to, you know, any of the events of 2020. It wasn't, um, you know, in response to the previous administration or anything. I just think it's important to point out that it wasn't a reactionary uh, uh, project for me. It was really more of a passion project and wanting to um, take a risk on getting in particular women together. I started doing this with mothers getting women together to talk about things that aren't often talked about uh, with regards to social identity and parenting specifically. Uh, so thus far, it's been amazing. Um, I've had a lot of you know, very humbling acknowledgements and, and I would say that my plan is to continue to do all I can do in service to others. Uh, but to talk very specifically again about race, class and parenting and what it is, uh, race, class and parenting is an intervention that's using qualitative methods to facilitate dialogue in, um, you know, in, in different communities. The purpose is to foster compassion and empathy and support um, and awareness about the experiences of marginalized groups in our society. And the goal is to empower allies uh, with tools and to help support them in becoming who they want to be. And so just very quickly, this started as an idea. I was actually coming home from a lecture one day that I'd given at UCLA and I feel like I had an epiphany. I thought, I know so many dynamic, amazing, diverse women. I just wanna get them into a room and host a, a conversation and call it race, class and parenting. And it's either going to be amazing or I'm gonna collapse my social network in one afternoon. I don't know what's gonna happen. We're gonna see what happens. Um, but in fact, it was amazing because um, you know, there, I was able to create a safe space for us to have constructive conversation. And what I found is that parents in particular are my audience because I think that parents really have strong intentions about how they wanna raise their children. I think that we instinctively know that parenting is our greatest activism. And so this is a very important point upon which to focus our energies and our efforts um, is how are we going to raise our children, the next generation of citizens uh, to step into a higher potential. So that kind of leads me to the idea of allyship. Um, and you know, you might think of yourself as an ally or you might think of yourself as beginning or initiating a journey in allyship. And before you do that, a question that I want to start with that I always start with is, what is the vision of the world that you believe in? And you'd be amazed how often we don't really spend time thinking this through. I think, you know, people who are even ahead of the game in some ways have spent time thinking about a vision of themselves that they believe in 
or they've spent time meditating on a vision of their family, but very rarely do people go to higher levels of social eco ecology where they think about you know, their community or they think about their state or they think about their nation or the, the world over, overall. And it's not really even just thinking. So belief is sustained thinking. So it's where you really have concentrated and really spent the time to develop what you think the world should be like, what you believe the world should be like. And I put such emphasis on belief because um, belief is, uh, there's more responsibility in belief than thought. So I, I want you to really spend time, um, you know, it's not something that you necessarily can do right now, but I want you to jot this down if you're taking some notes and really commit to yourself to spend time on thinking about what you want your family to be like and what you want your neighborhood to be like and what you want your workplace to be like and your city and your country and the world. And, you know, I'm gonna challenge you to really see if you can envision that end state. I feel like, you know, one of the reasons why I'm really well suited to do this is because I do believe that racial reconciliation and social justice are foregone conclusions. And I feel like I have that vision of the end state uh, kind of imparted on my spirit. Um, so that's, that's one exercise I wanna leave you guys with. And that's something that you can also work through with your family and your kids. The second uh, kind of, I guess, journaling or workshopping activity that I want to impart to you is to, de to determine the shape of your allyship. So what do I mean by shape? Shape is actually an acronym that stands for your spiritual gifts, your heart's passion, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences. So in order for your personal allyship journey to be authentic and effective, it has to be really in alignment with who you are. And we all have different kinds of skill sets, different kinds of experiences that we have walking in the bodies that we are in um, that are going to lend us to different kinds of pathways of allyship. And so I encourage you to really spend time also thinking about that. You know, when I look at my own experiences, I've given you a very quick kind of bio sketch. Um, I, my spiritual gifts are missionary gift and teaching. When I say missionary gift, I just realize um, that I am a person who naturally feels comfortable around a wide variety uh, and different types of people. And, you know, that's in part to having grown up all over the United States, moving so much within the United States and having this international, uh, you know, career in sports where I've just been thrown into immersed into so many different kinds of social settings that, um, that it's really kind of a gift for me to be able to connect with people who are from a wide variety of backgrounds. My heart's passion is around justice and sustainability and education. Um, and as I mentioned, my abilities are facilitating conversation and research and speaking. I'm an extroverted introvert. I have a, also a very unique set of experiences as a bicultural African-American uh, woman who is the child of an immigrant who, like I said, moved so many times and had this international career. And now I am a wife and a mother of two black children uh, specifically. In, in, our, in our community in Southern California area. So looking at yourself and asking yourself, you know, what are your spiritual gifts? Are you the kind of person who has a tendency to speak truth to power? Are you a servant leader? Are you a teacher? Do you have the gift of encouragement or comfort? Are you a center of influence or a natural leader? Are you an optimist? Are you wise beyond your years? These are just kinds of gifts that you're born with that you know you naturally enhance over time through your experiences, but there are certain things that you just have a propensity towards, things that set you apart. Uh, so you need to uh, spend time reflecting on what those things might be. What's your heart's passion? When we say heart's passion, um, this is, uh, I did a lot of mentorship. Like I said, I taught undergraduates and I would constantly ask them, What's your heart's passion? What does your heart break for? Each one of us are uniquely made. We have a di different set of um, triggers in, in a way. And I don't mean, I mean that in a, maybe in a constructive way. Um, I used to use the example of the ASPCA commercials and you know, uh, you see the dogs that, uh, and the cats the, and animals that have been abandoned or abused. And there's a sad Sarah McLaughlin music. And I would say, you know, there's some of you who, you know, that really tugs at your heartstrings. 
Honestly, it's not me. Um, I have a dog. I love my dog, but I'm a humanist. And so I just know that about myself. I, I've identified where my heart's passions lie and everybody should determine for themselves what that's going to look like. Maybe it is in the space of you know animal uh, rights activism. Maybe it's in environmental activism. Maybe it's in social justice activism, but that's something for you to sit and reflect with. And as I talk through these things, these uh, um, ways of identifying who you are and what your allyship might look like, these are things that I hope you um, engage with for yourself, but also with your children and kind of walk them through these things. And if you have very young children, you can also start to help support them in their own identific identification of who they are and where their passions lie. What are your unique abilities? That's the next one, abilities. What skills do you possess? Um, what uh, academic and professional training have you had? Um, which abilities do you want to develop more? So think about what you actually can do uh, naturally or you know, what your training is, like I said, specifically, because that's also going to inform maybe where you would fit in and align more naturally in terms of uh, allyship or ju social justice work or environmental justice work. What are the hallmarks of your personality? Are you outgoing or reserved? Are you steadfast or easygoing? Are you diplomatic or executive? Are you analytical or spontaneous? And then finally, what are some of your formative experiences? Who are you? What is your race and ethnicity? What is your gender? Do you have a spiritual practice? Where did you grow up? How is your family composed? Uh, how have all of those dynamics shaped your worldview? And how is your perspective unique and why does it matter? Um, and you know, all of these questions, these might not be ways that you are typically used to hearing the introduction to a social justice conversation. But again, me wanting to support you in your allyship path, it's going to have to be very unique and specific to who you are in order for it to be authentic and sustainable. How can you be an effective ally? I also want everyone to be aware that allyship is going to require persistence, uh, vulnerability, and perseverance. It is not necessarily uh, an easy walk. And so firstly, I like to say allyship is more like a yoga practice. You are going to be making imperfect progress. You're going to be learning and growing and you're gonna be challenged. You're gonna make mistakes. So. Um, because of this, because I, I conceive allyship as something of a yoga practice or something that you have to practice at, I am a little bit concerned about um, the anti-racist movement. Now, I understand the underlying sentiment, the idea that we have to be proactive in dismantling systems of injustice, but I think one of the risks of anti-racist is that we create sort of minefields. And what I know from nearly a decade of teaching at the university level is that People need safe spaces to be wrong in order to learn genuinely and sincerely and authentically. There's an internal psychological process that has to happen. And sometimes people are going to get it wrong before they get it right. So um, I just, you know, encourage you to at least be patient with yourself. And, you know, even as you are supporting other people uh, within your network, also try to exercise as much patience and grace as possible, understanding that in order for us to make, again, that authentic and sustainable true progress, um, people are going to make mistakes. Uh, it, it is a process. <clears throat> The second thing that you're going to have to do to be effective in your allyship uh, progress is work on building your knowledge and exposure. Um, in particular, if you come from a privileged uh, social identity, you're gonna have to realize the paradox of your position that on the one hand, um, you are um, you know, experiencing the privilege, you have this opportunity to leverage uh, the privilege, but there are so many uh, experiences that you aren't naturally privy to by virtue of not having lived through uh, the experience of the less privileged position. And we'll talk more about this as we go on. Um, you're going to have to also own multiple narratives of the group that you are intending to align yourself with. Uh, so for example, if you're saying, I really wanna align myself with uh, you know, women, then it would behoove you to inform yourself on the spectrum, the broad spectrum and range of experiences that women are having you know, within our immediate social context and within a broader social context, context because 
no social group, whether we're talking about a racial group or gender or you know, a religious group, no social group is a monolith. And truly, bigotry begins with stereotypes, even um, stereotypes that seem innocuous. Uh, so building exposure and building knowledge is kind of the fundamental underlying process to um, effective and sustainable allyship. The third thing is you're going to have to appreciate that allyship is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's going to take humility. You're going to have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and that means, you know, within social situations where you may have to assert yourself or assert a different opinion, but even within the context of your own household as a parent, you know, because you're not going to, again, um, proceed perfectly in your own process. And you're going to have to show some vulnerability uh, and you're going to have to model that vulnerability for your children, just showing that willingness to be wrong, but to try again and to show a uh, perseverance in the form of a tolerance for criticism, um, for constructive criticism in particular. And then, uh, like I said, you're going to need to also develop your assertion by um, committing to starting and stopping difficult conversations. There are certain conversations that are going to have to be initiated, and then there are times when their conversations are going to have to be cut off. And so all of this is going to um, take you developing within yourself a kind of boldness. And as you develop that within yourself, you will be able to model that productively for your children as well. <clears throat> and then the final piece uh, to, uh, to um, understand is that social privilege is extremely complex. And so I wanna talk about, like I said, social privilege today, but some social privileges can offset the vulnerabilities of other social disadvantages. And I wanna talk about how that plays out. But again, this kind of more speaks to the, um, the concept that no social group is a monolith and we don't want to stereotype and we want to understand that social privilege is dynamic and contextual. Um, and, and that will give us a fuller understanding. So just to kind of summarize this, this much so far, an ally is a person who wants to align themselves with a particular uh, group or movement uh, on behalf, of, you know, on behalf of that group or, or movement that they don't actually belong to. Um, you should think about a vision of the world that you believe in and what your role could be in bringing about that vision. I think so many people uh, miss that this is kind of one of the processes that's going to bring us the most meaning and satisfaction in our lives to understand what we think the world should be, can be, and who we are in manifesting that vision of the world. Um, you should also understand the unique shape of your own personal allyship. Uh, you should understand that allyship is going to require persistence, vulnerability, and perseverance. And truly, at some point in life, we all need allies. So we're going to need to know how to empower our allies um, and how to be constructive, um, how to extend grace, how to step back when we are feeling triggered, and how to acknowledge our own limitations. Um, and then another point that I want to say is that everyone who's engaged in this struggle, struggle for an equitable society, um, you know, as an ally is going to need to have ruthless optimism. And I often say that uh, ruthless optimism is my own personal superpower. I feel as though um, that's, again, what sets me apart and what makes me very well suited to do this kind of work uh, because I have a very positive, a very firm positive view of what the world can be, should be, and will be, and understand my own role in bringing about that vision for the betterment of myself and others. <clears throat> so to talk about privilege in particular, because this is a conversation, you know, the, the main premise of this conversation is to talk about how to leverage social privilege, teaching our children how to leverage their social privilege on behalf of themselves and others. I really want to spend a good stretch of time right now talking about um, short stories, uh, three short stories on privilege. And these are three personal stories from my own lived experience. Um, before I do that, 
I want to talk a little bit about the limitations of case study examples because I'm responsible in framing these stories. I do think that storytelling is one of the most powerful modes of communication. And as a trained scientific researcher in statistical data analysis, I think I can really appreciate the value of anecdote in making real uh, certain paradigmatic constructs or concepts that would otherwise be really difficult to access um, because they're described at very high levels of abstraction. So for example, we have constructs or ideas like love, friendship, empowerment, patriotism. Um, these are you know, very abstract concepts, but they're given greater internal psychological significance when we can operationalize them through anecdote. Um, stories can compel and inspire. Whenever we share our experiences, we actually serve one another in our divine purpose to mentor each other. We leverage our pains and our successes for the benefits of others to deepen our humanity in the process. And we make more meaning out of our life experiences through vulnerable communication. But at the same time, you know, qualitative case study examples or stories have limitations. There's no predictive value in a single anecdote. In other words, uh, stories can be illustrative, but not definitive. Um, there's no statistical significance to a single story. And we have to be cautious about defaulting to generalization uh, based on a single narrative, whether it's positive or negative. Um, another challenge with storytelling is that interpretations of our own experiences are inherently subject to bias. So even as we recount an experience and draw conclusions about that experience, it's impossible to be completely objective. Much of the interpretation is going to be influenced by narratives of our conscious or unconscious minds. So no matter how objective we intend to be, we're always impacted by underlying assumptions. Um, but you know, despite these limitations, I, I wanna share some stories with you because I think when used appropriately, stories can help us to process and understand by animating nuance and complexity of social dynamics that are almost impossible to grasp. Otherwise, stories give us insight and this insight will make us wise and this wisdom will make us compassionate. So I want to share three stories for you very quickly. The first is about my Dolores. Um, I don't have any memory of my biological maternal grandmother at all. I was six months when she died from heart failure. I've only ever seen one small three by five faded picture of her that's on a that's in a tiny ornate frame um, that sits on an armoire in my parents' house. Uh, when I was little, I used to squint at the picture and try to understand what kind of person my grandmother was actually based on this candid shot. Um, the photograph looks like she actually wasn't even ready for the, for the picture to be taken. It's mostly of her profile as she's sitting resting casually in a chair. She seemed to have just turned her face towards the camera and her bright eyes are the most striking part of the sepia picture. She was a heavy set woman with creamy skin, quite different from my own, but I've always thought that I had eyes that looked like her. So I didn't know my mother's mother. The only grandmother that I knew at all for the first decade of my life was my mother's uh, father's girlfriend. So my maternal grandfather's girlfriend, Dolores. Uh, my grandfather never legally married again after my grandmother died. But even if I did realize that they weren't legally married, it didn't mean anything to me at the time as a young child. My grandfather and Dolores lived in rural Mississippi. They lived on land that my grandfather had worked as a sharecropper before moving to uh, the more urban environment of Vicksburg, with his family. Uh, eventually, my grandfather moved back uh, to the rural area with Dolores, and it took hours to get to this wooded farmland. And frankly, it was underwhelming to travel all that way to arrive at this tiny house that was hardly more than a shack that didn't have any running water or electricity. Dolores wasn't much of a housekeeper, despite the fact that there wasn't much house to keep. Um, this was probably because of her size, she was an extremely obese woman and I used to feel a little uncomfortable around her. She had a strong body odor. She was missing some teeth. She had whiskers growing out of a mole on her chin. Her entire presentation was intimidating. And in my upbringing to that point, I had been sheltered from real poverty. 
I grew up in predominantly white suburban communities. My dad had multiple graduate degrees and a corporate job in banking. All of the differences between their lifestyle and my own were hard to process. And my lack of exposure meant I could only respond with fear. I remember standing in front of her upon entering their living room. I was in a ruffled dress and my lace trim socks were folded neatly over my Mary Janes. And she would say, oh, doesn't the baby look cute? And then she would um, lift her enormous arm and gesture, come and give me some sugar. This was always the worst part of every visit. I would always excuse myself to the bathroom and wipe off the place where she had pressed against my cheek. Neither my grandfather or Dolores had an education, but my grandfather carried himself in a distinctly dignified way because he had served in the military. Uh, unfortunately, like so many veterans, he struggled with alcoholism, uh, probably as a coping mechanism. His alcohol abuse made him physically abusive to my biological grandmother, and I can only imagine that he may have abused Dolores uh, as well, even though I never personally saw him hit anyone. Dolores drank heavily also. Both she and my grandfather had their own flasks, and I remember because I had never ever seen anyone else carrying canteens of alcohol on their person before them. I had barely ever seen my own father touch alcohol on special occasions. You know, my dad might take a beer and then pretend to drink it. Uh, um, but later I would learn that Dolores also had a drug addiction problem. Um, she and my grandfather were on again and off again for many years. I saw less and less of her when we would go to Mississippi to visit until one day I heard that Dolores had left my grandfather for good. She continued to struggle with drug abuse and prostitution. And finally, one day I learned that Dolores had been murdered. Her body was found completely naked with evidence of strangulation floating in the Mississippi River. Dolores was the post intersectional social disadvantage. Uh, she and my grandfather, I'm sorry, she was uneducated she lived in abject poverty with an abusive alcoholic. She was addicted to drugs and turned to prostitution to support her habits. I don't think she was in touch with anyone from her own family. I had never heard of any siblings or children that she had. She was estranged from her own family and practically without any support besides my mom's siblings. And there was always a strain dynamic there. When I learned of her death, I cycled through the emotions of grief, horror, relief, and disbelief, I struggled to put all of the broken pieces together to understand Dolores's life and death. And here's another complicated piece to this puzzle. Dolores was white. We hear a lot about white privilege and how this contributes to systemic inequality in our society. Being white in America is advantageous and white people do typically experience certain kinds of cultural, institutional, and legal immunities, just as they often have greater access to economic and social opportunities. Dolores did leverage her whiteness because in fact, her relationship with my grandfather had originally started before my grandmother even passed away. She would boldly knock on my grandmother's front door and ask her to fetch Henry for her. She had no shame because she knew that her whiteness protected her from any consequence that my black grandmother could even imagine to exact. She humiliated my grandmother at will. And some of my siblings even felt that the strain of that affair contributed to their mother's passing. But the white privilege that she leveraged to humiliate my black grandmother was not enough to protect her from the spiraling risks of poverty, alcoholism, domestic violence, drug addiction, or sexual violence. At the intersection of extreme poverty and gender identity, Dolores, my white grandmother, met her demise. Reflecting on this uh, you know, experience, I began to internalize some certain uh, facts about privilege, social privilege. I began to internalize the fact that the relationship between race and privilege is socially constructed and it survives through the single stories that we perpetuate. In reality, the social advantages assigned to one particular social construct 
can be outweighed by other types of social disadvantages. In turn, social disadvantages that create disproportionate vulnerability in an individual or for a group can also be offset significantly by other social advantages. In other words, there are many conflating and confounding variables that interact dynamically. Story. When I was eight years old, my family moved to rural Illinois, not suburban Illinois, rural Illinois. We lived in the Candlewick Lake community of a town called Poplar Grove. Uh, the nearest town to Poplar Grove is Argyle. This is the actual population sign from Argyle. As you can see, it says populations about 89 good people, 15 goats, and one old grouch. Um, the parking lot at our local high school accommodated tractors, and we didn't have cable television. So it was rural, not suburban, okay? Uh, and we were the only Black family in Candlewick. And I was the only Black child in the entire school I'm sorry, did I say school? In the entire school district. And we lived there for five years in an environment where no one looked like me, where the cultures and customs of my family were distinctively different from the cultures and customs of every other person in our community. My skin was different, my hair was different, my tolerance for freezing temperatures and everyone was different. And I was teased and bullied at times. It wasn't really easy for me as a child. But what happened during these formative years of my life was that I realized that I was never going to fit in in a traditional sense. Uh, so I had to abandon the desire to assimilate early in my life in order to adapt and survive and be happy. And this ended up being a huge blessing in my life, particularly from a gendered perspective. It was like I was completely free from the prescribed social definition of a girl because I was on the margin of what that definition was in my community anyway. So I could laugh loudly, I could challenge the boys, I could be good at math, I could be competitive, I could be sassy, I could be extra, I could be executive. It was all sort of socially acceptable because there was no prescription for what I should or should not be doing because I was the only one like me. And so interestingly, at a time in my life when it would seem I was the most marginalized, it was actually the time that I probably experienced the most privilege in my life. Uh, because to have privilege, in particular social privilege, means to have a special right or to have an advantage or to have, been, uh, to have immunity granted to a particular group or person. I was immune from social expectations because I was different. And I would not have had this privilege if I had been one of only a few black girls in my community. I was immune from social norms because I was the only little black girl for miles. And I would even argue that my black parents uh, did not raise me in close alignment with any particular expectation because they were also the only black parents around. So uh, they were as immune from cultural expectation as I was. And, um, you know, Perceived immunity from social norms radicalizes the way you carry yourself throughout the world. I, I reflect on this, but also I began to internalize from this experience, which is that all people have experiences of privilege and experiences of disadvantage at different times in their lives. Uh, but with a critically optimistic framework for processing our own experiences we may arrive at different conclusions about the determinants and outcomes of privilege in our own lives. And then the final quick story I want to share is the most recent. So a couple of years ago, uh, in the middle of cold and flu season, I picked up my son from his half day preschool uh, in Manhattan Beach. Uh, my plan was to go directly to Press Juicery after grabbing him to get some sort of gingery concoction to help fight off the upper respiratory whatever was starting to compound my head cold. Um, and every mom who's been sick with a small child, a preschooler can imagine how the day was going. Uh, when I got out of the busy juice shop, I spent five minutes convincing my son that, you know, even though he had had a bad day because cantaloupe had been served at snack, that we could turn the day around and salvage the day if he would just get in the car and put his car seat on. Uh, uh, so, you know, I finally got him in the car, and I sat, you know, my $50 bag of press juice on my late model Mercedes minivan. I took a deep breath and I pulled a U-turn to head to my house back in Playa Vista. 
Uh, about a mile down the road, a dinged up SUV pulled up next to me and the driver signaled for me to roll my window down. Something year old white woman speaking at me through the glass. Her hair was more gray than black. It was pulled up into a messy bun and she just wore a nondescript kind of mauve t-shirt. I rolled down the window, preparing myself to be as helpful as possible to this woman who I assumed was in need of directions. I sniffled really hard so that I could sound less nasally. And I pushed up my you know, large frame Balenciaga sunglasses that I like to wear when I'm sick or pretending to be important in LA. And I forced a smile through my cold. Um, but when I heard her question, I realized that she wasn't necessarily lost, but that she was certainly misdirected. She hollered, you think because you're rich, you don't have to obey the traffic laws? What, <laughs> what, excuse me, excuse me, my smile fell, okay? She repeated herself again, making every syllable staccato. I guess you think you can do whatever you wanna do because you're rich. And she went on to explain in a raised voice that I had made a U-turn over double yellow lines. I glanced back over my shoulder at my son, who was attentively watching our interaction. And I was momentarily kind of paused by the social complexity of the situation. A 50 something year old white woman followed me for more than a mile in Manhattan Beach to accuse me, a first generation uh, American, at the time 35 year old black woman of being privileged and feeling entitled above the law in front of my black son. Now, I grew up all over the United States, and I've been on the receiving end of a lot of prejudgments, but never before this moment had the assumption been that I was privileged. As a woman of color, I faced so much bias and bigotry in my life. Um, it was, you know, I worked so hard for everything, I just couldn't understand how it wasn't apparent to this white woman of a certain age. And she was leaning forward, aggressively poised for an argument, her posture read like she might try to jump in my car and perform a citizen's arrest. But when I looked into her eyes, I saw her humanity hiding behind her bravado. And frankly, I felt her heaviness and it was truly heavier than mine. And I just surprised myself by answering patiently and honestly, I, I really don't know. I don't think money has anything to do with it, but I don't know. I have a pretty bad cold and my head's in a fog you're right that I need to be more careful. Thanks for bringing it to my attention. I definitely think I just need to go to bed. And that's what I said. And I just thought to myself, wow, therapy does work. Now it was her turn to pause and process a bit more deeply because I had given her the one type of response she was never expecting, which was a compassionate one. Her demeanor changed and she just nodded humbly at me. And my son and I watched her pull off to the east of the intersection. And that interaction continues to fascinate the researcher in me. As a college professor, I have an arguably advanced understanding of racial and economic disparities. I know, for example, that across several measures of socioeconomic status, homeownership, household wealth, and median income, uh, major gaps persist between Blacks and whites in America. And these wealth gaps hold across education levels. So another way of articulating this is that my PhD does not equate, equate to the same economic privilege as peers with white skin, or my husband's MBA is not valued the same as his white counterparts. While that injustice is very real and very problematic, it's also very relative. So this U-turn exchange left me thinking about the rapidly changing dynamics in the world that we live in and the unique dynamics of microcosms that exist in affluent communities like Manhattan Beach, where my children went to preschool, or Ply Vista, where we live now, or Beverly Hills, where my husband's office is located. Uh, in some sense, U-turn is just the perfect metaphor. I would describe uh, my husband and myself as strivers. My father is an African immigrant that came to the United States during the brain drain of the African brain drain of the 1970s and 80s. Uh, my mother is a descendant of Mississippi sharecroppers, as I mentioned, and we often marvel at how our parents have been able to achieve so much in the space of just one generation. They represent the inflection point in our genealogy, and my husband and I have been very intentional to continue this progress. So as a result, for the first time in my family's history, my Black children are poised to experience more privilege than disadvantage in their lives. Um, you know, and I, and I think that my family narrative is not the only turnaround tale. 
As Americans, we've been making something of a U-turn away from our history of slavery and injustice towards civil rights and social acceptance. Obviously, this transition is not linear and it's very disjointed, but efforts have been made through policy and culture to move us towards a more inclusive vision of our nation. Uh, so, I also began to internalize a host of uh, realities. Began to understand that privilege is a relative construct. The social privileges and disadvantages um, that we have are only operationalized in a, in a social context, meaning these measures have no comparative value. The sum of the disadvantages that create vulnerability in my life are relative to the sum of others. And they're also relative to the context. So if we don't understand this, we'll never be able to sincerely extend ethical consideration to other people. We are not in the oppression Olympics. We're trying to extend compassion and resources to people who need it when they need it, period. And when we abase our privilege, in any form, we show a lack of humanity, period. So as far as, you know, social privilege again, what is it? I wanna give you a working definition. I have these stories that I feel like, um, you know, underlie or highlight some of the nuances, as I said, of social privilege, some of the, um, you know, lesser known or more nebulous or more um, difficult uh, parts of privilege to tease out. But I think it's important for us to have a working definition that we begin to understand. And um, I had a question also about social privilege that came in from, from the, the uh, conversations. So social privilege is a socially constructed identity that is considered standard or typical. So to help us understand this and to help us be able to explain this to our children. This social identity is the least likely to be discriminated against. And there is a greater chance that the benefit of the doubt will be leveraged for this identity. And I just wanted to address the question, the question that came in about children of mixed race. And I think the question was, you know, if the child is mixed race, but looks white, um, you know, how to grapple with that kind of, um, social privilege or that kind of social identification. I think what I want to impress is that race is a social construct determined by the participants of a specific social context. It's not absolute. So uh, we are not necessarily the arbiters of our own racial identity. Race is operationalized in a social context. Your race is relative to the people around you. It's based on how people perceive you and it's relative to the, the environment and the context. And so for my children, the way I explain this is, you know, in the United States, we are black. When we go to visit my dad's country in Ghana, we're not black because black doesn't really exist because the, everybody's black in that social context. Everybody more or less is black in that social context. So um, you know, just so that the children can understand that these identities are fluid and take on different characteristics. So what does it mean to have social privilege? I firmly believe that social privilege is not an inherently bad thing. Where you have social privilege, you have greater opportunity and more options. The challenge arises because there are risks associated with having a privileged identity. You are at risk of lacking empathy, you are at great risk of implicit bias and you are at risk of exacting microaggressions, um, often unknowingly. So what you need to do where you have social privilege is to humble yourself, educate yourself, and there are a whole host of implicit bias association tests that are available for you to be able to see where you are making assumptions or where you have blind spots uh, to other people's experiences and then finally, you need to leverage your privilege to support other people. And like I said, we'll talk about that. I also wanna talk about what does it mean to have a social disadvantage? Um, if you have a, an identity, a social identity that is disadvantaged, it means that it is an identity that is vulnerable to negative stereotyping and profiling. It is a social identity that is more likely to be discriminated against 
They, there tend to be fewer accommodations for this identity. There's a greater chance that there will be a lack of accountability for bias or injustice against you. Um, and this identity is more likely to be associated with adverse outcomes, both statistically and present and historically. So I, I had a specific question about, you know, how to support children who have been on the receiving end of, of uh, prejudice. And so, you know, I would direct you to this slide where we're talking about what does it mean to have a social disadvantage? Because again, we want to frame this responsibly for children. Where you have social disadvantages, the facts are that you have perpetual vulnerability. The risks of social disadvantages are that you are at risk of being denied certain opportunities and you're at risk of having limited options. But what you really need to do is, number one, learn to advocate for yourself. Number two, learn to identify and empower your allies. And number three, you really need to essentially offset this vulnerability however possible. So one example is, you know, uh, it, I feel like my parents have really, uh, pushed me to pursue a great education. Education is kind of an earned form of social privilege, but that is, you know, has always been what they've instructed me as a way to offset some of the social vulnerabilities that are created by, you know, immutable characteristics like my gender and my race. The reason why it's important to talk about all of this is because there's a relationship between this social privilege and social disadvantage and broader systemic injustice or systemic bias. So systemic injustice, um, in my opinion, is a combination of biased attitudes, assumptions, cultural norms, business practices, policies, and applications of rules of law that maintain a disproportionate vulnerability for minorities and other marginalized groups. So we're taking this away from a one-to-one -one interaction and looking at, at how people are faring <clears throat> what their experiences are at broader levels of social ecology, not just, you know, it's not just about kind of a bullying, you know, if we take race as an example, it's not like a bullying from one person to another, but it's about an entire system of uh, attitudes, assumptions, cultural norms, kind of business practices, the application of rules and laws that are manifesting in, you know, statistically significantly different outcomes for uh, particular groups in our society. How is this systemic bias operationalized? Like I said, limited opportunities for certain groups of people, lack of representation for certain groups of people, limited options for certain groups of people. And I feel like the most compelling one is lack of accountability for wrongs against, uh, uh, wrongs against you. So if you are from a socially disadvantaged group and, you know, some sort of action is taken or some sort of wrong is done against you on the basis of your marginalized identity, it's very difficult to seek justice. And I think that that's, you know, kind of the, the more serious sticking point on how systemic bias is operationalized. I wanna refer you guys to uh, my YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel, Mom Peditor, like competitor, Mom Peditor by Mimi Narte. But if you search Mimi Narte in YouTube, you'll find uh, my channel and you'll find a whole host of things. But I have a playlist on race, class, and parenting, which is an additional resource for you, with information around social justice parenting. And I have a video that I encourage you to watch about how I've conceptualized race racism as a social cancer. Um, because one thing that I think is really unfortunate is sometimes people look at exceptional examples or outliers of, uh, you know, people who are doing well in one regard to try to dismiss you know, you know, the entire systemic bias like racism. Um, but in fact, we wouldn't look at a person who's a cancer survivor and say that cancer isn't a real thing, it doesn't really exist, or it's not serious, or it doesn't warrant research attention. So um, I feel like, again, it's a, to me, a serious lack of humanity to look at one example of one person, or a few people who've done well, a, a specific subset, and try to dismiss the pain or the oppression or the persecution of the whole. So I will direct you to that for greater information. Um, I also had a, a question about, you know, how to explain in children, how to explain privilege to young children. And I wanna tell you about this that I often use in my workshops, 
which is, you know, I use a piggy bank analogy for very young children. If you have older children, I use a social balance sheet kind of analogy, just explaining that we all have certain kinds of privileges and we all have certain kinds of disadvantages. A privilege would be like a deposit into your social bank account and, you know, some sort of social, socially disadvantaged identity is like a withdrawal from your social bank account. And I think the important thing about this is, like I said, framing it responsibly where everybody knows that everybody has some form of privilege because it is relative. So, you know, because I have an international family, I know that being living in this area, living in the United States even, um, you know, is a great privilege compared to some of the uh, experiences for some of the family that I have living in developing country contexts. So it's really about us understanding, like I said, the relative value of these different kinds of social dynamics. And then what I like to implore or imp impress upon the children is that, you know, when you do this balance sheet or when you kind of add up what's in your piggy bank, where you have surplus, you can actually make a loan on behalf of other people who are, you know, in a deficit or experience a deficit in some ways. So I like this um, social piggy bank analogy. And I think that it's usually often goes all over very well where ki kids can understand, you know, how this is a dynamic process and it's not absolute, the idea of, of social privilege. So just quickly, again, the summaries of the takeaways on privilege before I move on to the six specific strategies, I'm going to kind of breeze through. Privilege is more complex and nuanced than is often communicated. Of course, there are many forms of social privilege and social disadvantage, and these interact dynamically to create experiences of opportunity and experiences of risk in our society. Uh, we need to reflect on our own experiences with a critically optimistic lens to see where we have privileges to leverage on behalf of other people. All privilege and all disadvantage is relative, and if you are attempting to minimize your privileges wherever they have them, wherever you have them, whether it's related to gender or related to class or related to race, you are inherently displaying a lack of humanity. Privilege is not intrinsically bad. Again, where we have privileges, we have options and opportunities uh, to help ourselves and others. But if we fail to acknowledge our privilege and the related moral responsibility our privilege becomes entitlement, which is socially destructive. So social disadvantage, on the other hand, is also not absolute. Where we have disadvantage, we don't always have the same options and opportunities. We do have perpetual risk in these areas, but social disadvantages can be offset by other forms of privilege. And focus on this can protect you know, my sense of optimism, and I think also a sense of optimism within your children. So uh, moving on to specific ways to uh, teach your children to leverage privilege, because I know we definitely had uh, questions too about concrete actions to be anti-racist within your family. And so again, my angle for the anti-racism today is really about leveraging privilege in a constructive way. The first thing is you want to teach your children to speak up for themselves and on behalf of others. And I know I had a, a question that came in also very recently uh, about this, about how to encourage children or motivate children to speak up, especially in the context of so much kind of anti-Asian sentiment that we've seen uh, recently and other forms of hate speech. Uh, teaching your children to speak up for themselves and other people begins with a foundation, a consistent foundation of physical and emotional safety. So when we look at research in general, and we see where people did not feel empowered to disrupt a conversation that was negative or where they felt it was something was being said that was wrong, that something that was being said was biased or unjust, um, often people don't feel physically or emotionally safe enough. That's what the, the researcher data shows. They didn't feel physically or emotionally safe enough to be able to speak in that moment. And so this is just an underlying, um, you know, like I said, foundational uh, platform that we need to be building from where your children, you know, are being raised in safe environments where they are being taught and instructed and shown on a consistent basis that their opinion matters, that they are empowered to speak up, uh, you know, where they, where they disagree, speak up, dis dis uh, speak up respectfully, where they have differing opinions. Um, the other thing that's really important here is that you, as the parent, are going to need to model a wide range of responses so that your children have specific behaviors that they can reference. Um, 
So, and, and why I'm seeing a wide range of emotional responses is because uh, in reality, you know, sometimes there are situations where you can deflect if you have also, you know, the social sophistication or charisma, you can use humor to disrupt or deflect or to interrupt a conversation that's going in a negative direction. Sometimes there might need to be an institutional level or policy level change that you may need to initiate. Sometimes you might actually have to be loud and more assertive or more bold or more aggressive. So there's a whole range of responses that are, are appropriate at different times. And it's going to be up to you to work on developing that assertion within yourself because your children are going to learn from how it is that you're interacting with other people. Um, the second way that we need to teach our children to leverage their privilege is to teach them about their moral obligation to make the most of themselves by finding and pursuing their own unique purpose with passion. Um, because really, wherever you have privileges, again, you have a moral obligation to make the very most of yourself and to pursue what is going to uh, make you happy in life and what you can do uh, that will also be in service to humanity and other people. And this starts with radically unconditional self-love. Um, because I think so often people are confused or, or you know, kind of learn indirectly that um, self-worth is relative. And that's not true. Privilege is relative, but self-worth is not. Each child needs to be taught that they have an intrinsic value that is not relative to other people. And I think that, uh, you know, as I've done this work over many years, I see that oftentimes the under, one of the major underlying themes to people's bias is that they really feel like they don't have an intrinsic value, that their value is only relative to another group that they can um, you know, oppress, uh, you know, in some sort of way to kind of give themselves a higher social standing. So we want to make sure that our children are free from this, you know, default internalized um, uh, narrative and that they know that they are already automatically have value and worth and capacity that isn't about, you know, their relative position because of their race or their class or their gender or their religion to other people. Uh, the third thing is that we want to give our children authentic immersive experiences to become participant observers in realities that are different from their own. And this is actually a prerequisite to conversations about social injustice. So what I mean is before you start talking about the different kinds of you know, current events of social injustice, um, it is not appropriate it's not going to be developmentally appropriate. It's not going to be um, productive in the way that you hope if your children don't already own multiple narratives about the group that's being marginalized or oppressed that you're talking about in that current event. So, you know, very specifically, I could say if your children don't own multiple, a variety of narratives about, you know, the African American experience or the Black experience here within the United States and in other parts of the world, um, it's probably not going to be. Uh, as productive as you would like to talk about something like, you know, the George Floyd uh, um, you know, murder, because they don't have enough context to actually humanize uh, um, George Floyd and or Black people in general who are experiencing social injustice. So that's one example, but it goes for all range of people. You know, I have a couple of different uh, narratives in some of my books where I talk about kind of the uh, range of stories and experiences that I share with my daughter about people that are close to our family who are Jewish prior to introducing conversation about the Holocaust. Um, but what does this mean? It's going to take an investment to give your children these authentic and immersive experiences. Um, but it goes back to what's the vision of the world that you actually believe in? Because it might require that you have to put your child on a softball team, you know, across town or some someplace away where it's going to be inconvenient, um, you know, on a on a shorter kind of time frame for you to execute on this. But if this is something that you really believe in and that you're making a central value, then that you're going to find the will to execute on that. And I, I also will connect this to a question that I had about um, different kinds of books. We can't always give our child every single kind of experience or access or exposure to every single kind of person. So there are definitely lots of books and different kinds of uh, literature or you know film, different kinds of ways of exposing our children to 
reality is different than their own. Um, I have also a review of books for uh, Black History Month on my YouTube channel that you can access. Um, but I think one of the main emphasis or takeaway points for that is that they shouldn't all just be narratives about social justice or civil rights. I mean, I think I have a book that's about a little black girl who's a cowgirl. And, and again, it's about being able to find the humanity, the common humanity and that relatability for your children. Uh, fourth, kind of related to that, you want to train your young children in particular to first seek to identify with others. So, you know, this starts as simply as I, I know when my children were in school, you know, I'd say, oh, wow, look, you have red shoes and he has red shoes. Oh, wow, look, he likes Pokemon, you like Pokemon. It's simple ways of pointing out because you're training your child how to think, especially when they see somebody who you know physically might be different from them, but you're training them to be focused on where the commonalities lie, where they can scan in their mind and in their brain, that will become their habit is scanning for commonality rather than scanning for difference. And so I would implore you to choose to model curiosity rather than judgment in your interpersonal interactions to teach your children to be humble and compassionate. So, you know, in, rather than um, judging, if you see somebody who's wearing some sort of head wrap, a hijab that's different than yours, you might just say, oh, wow, that's a beautiful hijab. I wonder why she's wearing that. I wonder what that represents to her. I wonder what that means to her. So again, so much of this is going to be about how we're modeling for our children to teach them how to think and act and behave critically and compassionately. Uh, the fifth one is helping your children to develop and organized and or to, to develop the skills to organize community resources to address the social and environmental justice issues that they're passionate about. And this relates to a question that I had about getting older kids engaged. You need to get them engaged um, through authentically aligned interests. So whatever your child is into, you know, if your child is into sports, there are opportunities for your child to reach out and organize and make an impact through sports. I, I love sports and that's why we have a sports foundation um, because that is a, an authentically aligned pathway for me to make a difference. And so that's what I encourage you to do with your children that are older as they are starting to understand more about themselves, what they're interested in. They're artists, they're musicians, there are pathways and opportunities through their own gifts and talents to be able to organize and address issues that are, are um, compelling to them. And then finally, um, this one's uh, you know, also very important. You want creating opportunities for others to be part of your family culture. You know, there's this great quote by MLK Jr. Uh, about lifting yourself up by your bootstraps. And he says, you know, I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. But it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. Um, so definitely uh, people from certain communities are not experiencing or do not have access to the same level of opportunity uh, or options as you know, some of us are in, who are in privileged uh, positions. So you need to ask yourself, how often are we giving people opportunities that they can grow into? And again, modeling that for your children, letting them know that that is part of a value. I would say that in my own lived experience, I have benefited so much from people who gave me opportunities um, or who took a chance on me, who gave me opportunities, um, you know, leverage the privilege that they had, the social standing they had, the professional standing that they had to give me a chance. It made a big difference in my life. And this is one of the most important and kind of relatively simple ways that we can leverage privilege um, on behalf of other people. This is obviously something that I could talk about all day and you know we could all talk about at length because there's so many different aspects and dynamics to this conversation. But again, I appreciate each one of you for coming on and making yourself uh, vulnerable um, and wanting to learn and wanting to proceed in a way to raise your children to be loving and sensitive and compassionate. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.